Uh, thank you all for coming. And as people are kind of straggling in, I'm going to just hit a better around a little bit. Um, so first of all, I just wanted to mention this is so this is my first um, actual live speaking. I did one online a while ago. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I'm actually fairly new to cybersecurity in general. So I've been in uh, the community for just a very short time. And so I just wanted to say to all of you out there, first of all, thank you for being awesome people in the community because this community is just so um, oversharing in a good way and, um, and just so encouraging. And part of the reason I'm up here today is because of all of the people that I've been surrounded by that are, are encouraging. So, if any of you are like me a year ago and you're aspiring to do a speech, I highly encourage you to submit um, for something. If you think it's important, somebody else is going to think it's important. So just know you do have something important to say. So, with that, I hope you think that I have something important to say. Um, obviously, you at least somewhat do because you showed up to this room. So, unless you're lost, uh, you're here to see Push Comes to Show. Uh, exploring the CCM attack paths. And so did you know that SCCM is 28 years old? So SCCM is actually older than Active Directory. And I'm calling it SCCM, but it's currently known as Microsoft Endpoint Configuration Manager. Uh, there's like a million hashtags for SCCM, I realize now. Um, so it actually started in 20, or uh, sorry, not 20, that would not be 28 years, in 1994. And in 1994, it came out as SMS, or Systems Management Server. And just for reference, do you know what else happened in 1994? That was not the year I was born. Nice try. But Justin Bieber was born that year. <laughs> China was first connected to the internet. And this guy, became a billionaire pretty much overnight. Uh, but it's not a talk about 1994. And so while you might not remember where you were when Richard Nixon died, which was also 1994, by the way, you might remember where you were when you heard me talk about the gross vulnerabilities in SECM. So my name is Brandon Colley. You can find me online on Twitter at TechBrandon. I already lost some audience members, Chris. Uh, I have 15 years of sysadmin experience. I've been securing Active Directory and Windows um, through several different uh, previous jobs. I'm currently a recovering SCCM administrator. Uh, thank you, one of my friends, Jake, for uh, letting me use that joke. So uh, I say that because I actually supported SCCM at three separate institutions. The most recent one I actually built from the ground up and implemented a lot of the poor things that you're about to see today. Currently, uh, over the last seven months, I've worked with uh, Trimark Security, and we perform Active Directory assessments for clients, big and small. We do Azure AD, we do VMware, we essentially do uh, whatever the client really asks of us. And possibly most importantly, I am a big Kansas City Chiefs fan. I actually almost wore my jersey today. So, maybe later tonight for the after party. So our agenda, I assume most of you already have at least a brief understanding of SCCM, but we're going to go through it anyway. Uh, I'm going to talk about the client install, and I'm also going to talk about the client push settings, as well as the recommendations that are surrounding those. I'm then going to talk about the vulnerabilities that are mitigated, or attempted to be mitigated, by some of these recommendations. And then we get the fun stuff. We get to do some attack demonstrations. I've got three separate attack demos that I'll show you guys. And uh, I'm really excited that the first time publicly, this is part of a uh, responsible disclosure for CVE that just got released earlier this week. There's a knowledge base article that just came out on Tuesday, I believe it was, that patches uh, some of the vulnerabilities that I'm showing you guys how to, to attack right now. So. So either you're welcome, or I'm sorry, it depends on which side of the fence you are on this. <laughs> so we're going to talk about when push comes to shove, how an attacker can fully compromise Active Directory in multiple different ways. You'll see Windows and SCCM behaviors that extract administrative credentials. 
how attackers use those credentials to move laterally. And then we'll also figure out how you can completely bypass all mitigations. And this attack is, uh, could be used as a vehicle for not only just elevating to domain administrators incredibly quickly, but could also be used for something like ransomware. And so we're going to close the talk too, as long as I've got enough time and I talk fast enough with some mitigations. So here we go. So SCCM, like I said, I assume most of you know SCCM, but some of you might be lost, so uh, thanks for sticking around anyway. SCCM is a systems management uh, application that manages endpoints. It's typically used to patch systems for their OSs, deploy applications, deploy operating systems, and it does much, much more than that. Typically, it requires more than one full-time employee to manage SCCM, depending on the size of your organization. SCCM relies on the uh, client installation, so this is a client-based application. And when you first install SCCM, you get to pick your poison here on which method you'd like to use to install the client on all of your endpoints. And so the client install pu uh, st uh, client push is the one that we're going to be talking about today. So why do people pick the client push, right? Well, it's very easy to do. It's been around for a long time. And I think most importantly, it's actually listed first in the documentation. And so we all sysadmins are like water and we just take the path of least resistance, right? So honestly though, SCCM push accounts are fairly attractive because of the integrations that they have with Active Directory. So here's a screenshot of the uh, system discovery. The system discovery can be mapped into your Active Directory so whenever new machines come online, they automatically are put into SCCM. The second piece of that is installing the client on those machines. And so here's the screenshot of the client push installation properties. And then you also have to configure the accounts. And so these accounts are configured because uh, to install the application, you need administrative credentials on the endpoint. And so here's where you can configure your, or your uh, usernames, passwords for the accounts that are gonna do that installation. So basically our workflow here is gonna be add, add a new machine to the domain, that machine automatically gets injected into SCCM, and then SCCM automatically pushes the client with one of these accounts. So some of you might have seen this coming a little bit. Uh, client push is generally not recommended by Microsoft. They talk about the local administrative privileges that are required as being a major reason why they don't recommend this. And so that's where the talk typically would end, right there. But lucky for us, we're going to keep going. So they offer, if you must, and I like to capitalize must here if I could, uh, if you must use the client push, first of all, do not put your account in domain administrators. So you're game over already if you've done that. <coughs> Instead, they recommend that you spread the access across multiple accounts, and this limits your attack surface. Lastly, they recommend that you enforce Kerberos mutual authentication, and that is also known as this allowing fallback to NTLM. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more as that's essentially what we're talking about through the entire talk. So the allow connection to fallback to NTLM setting, this setting was added in 2018. Uh, version 18.06 was released for SCCM and that's when this was added. Up until, and I just learned this earlier this week, up until the most recent install of SCCM, this is unchecked by, or sorry, this is checked by default. So by default, all your installs are allowing fallback to NTLM. The most recent version that just was released, uh, if for a brand new install, does now uncheck this as the recommendation states. So just to clarify what this setting actually does, so Kerberos authentication is what's gonna be preferred as far as just Windows in general goes. So communication between your clients and your servers are gonna prefer Kerberos, but if Kerberos fails to authenticate or it can't use Kerberos for whatever reason, this setting will allow it to fall back to NTLM. All right, and so to further explain the 
the configuration or the vulnerable configuration, I like to break it down into three pieces. So the first piece is the NTLM hash of the push accounts. So I don't have time to really dig into NTLM, and um, so I'm not. Instead, all you really need to know is that it is a, uh, it's a hashed credential. Kerberos is considered a better method and a more secure method, and is much newer than NTLM. <coughs> The second piece of the puzzle is the heightened privileges that are granted to those client push accounts. So by nature, and essentially the sole purpose of those accounts are to perform installs on your endpoints. And like I said earlier, do not make them domain administrators. Even though you need administrative credentials on all of your endpoints, it's still not a good idea. Uh, at Trimark, we assess this, and we see still about 20% of our customers are continuing to do this, and this is considered a critical issue. So the last piece is the action of the SCCM server performing the install, or kicking off the client install. And what I mean by that is that the server controls when the client gets pushed to the endpoint, or at least it's supposed to. So if an attacker is able to somehow trigger that installation process, they can put themselves in a position to where they can capture the NTLM hash of the push account and gain administrative credential on the endpoint. And so now we're starting to see the problem. This is a problem that's actually been around for all four years. So this is around the same time that the patch, or not really the patch, but the uh, the NTLM fallback setting was created. So the, Matt uh, tweeted this out back in February of 2018, and he says that if you can elevate an endpoint, uh, you can gain the NTLM hash of the domain service account that's used to install an agent. And then, oh, by the way, that's a local admin on all of the endpoints that it manages. Um, in replies to this, Matt goes on to explain a little bit about how you might uh, be able to coerce that in the installation to occur, and you can simply just uninstall the agent if you already have administrative rights on the endpoint. You can uh, leverage WMI to downgrade the version, and so when SCCM checks back in, SCCM is going to see that it either doesn't have a client or it has an old client, and it's going to attempt to reinstall. So that's all great, but it can take you know seven days, twenty days, however long it's going to take for that cycle to occur. So I found a better way to do it. And so in fact one, I like to call this all the creds. So with this attack, we're gonna assume that we just have a regular user credential. We're assuming breach at this point. We have fished the user, or we found something, on a password underneath a keyboard, whatever. Just a normal domain user account. We're also assuming some default configurations, which uh, by Microsoft standards means misconfigurations. So by that, the two that we're really going to attack is the domain join permission. And if you're not familiar with this, this is by default. All authenticated users are able to add up to 10 machines to your domain unless this has been mitigated. We're also assuming the allow fallback to NTLM is enabled. With those set up, we're then able to force NTLM authentication to occur. I mentioned earlier that Kerberos is going to be the preferred method so if we're able to, as an attacker, join a computer to the domain, we can downgrade the authentication and force NTLM to occur by removing the host SPNs of that Active Directory object. So the other piece I want to talk about that's before we get to the hack and all the, all the creds, the reason I call it all the creds is because we're going to attempt to capture all of the credentials that are configured for your SEC push account. So I like to break this down by the difference between the in theory and the reality of how SCCM does this. And I blogged about this back in January. But the theory is that you can set up multiple push accounts that target only a select few computers for each account. And while this is true on how you can configure it on the back end, it's not how SCCM is set up. SCCM, in reality, works in a much more linear fashion, 
And by that I mean it's going to attempt the first account in the list. If that account fails to install an agent, it will uh, try next and the next and the next and so on. And so we can simply just remove local administrator to force all of the credentials to send. And so while you might not have a single account that's a domain administrator, with all of those accounts combined, we are Captain Plan. I'm going to let you guys read this real fast. All right, before I do the demo, I'm going to do the same disclaimer. Um, use your powers for good. If you don't have approval, don't, don't hack something, please. Um, so here's your demo. So here is going to be just our attacker's machine. So obviously in the lab, I'm just using VMs. The S in theory could just be an attacker's virtual machine. And the first thing we're going to do is join this machine to the domain. I mentioned by default we've already uh, stolen credentials. So we're going to join the Brandon Rocks domain. Hope you all agree with our domain join account. This guy is just a domain user, and we've now created an account in Active Directory for this computer. And before we restart, I'm going to open up a PowerShell. Is the word, so do you have to say shell twice? So PowerShell shell, is that how you say I'm opening a PowerShell shell? No. No, it's just PowerShell, okay. So I'm opening a PowerShell, and I'm running it as the domain join account. And the reason I'm doing this is because that account was used to add the computer to the domain, it's the owner on that Active Directory object. And if you own an object, you can manipulate all of its properties. And so here I'm running the set SPN with a delete, and I'm gonna delete these host SPNs. And the reason this prevents Kerberos from authenticating is because it breaks that communication between the client and the server. So when the server is attempting to reach out and find this computer, to push the agents to it, it's not going to be able to authenticate with Kerberos any longer. And now with a little bit of power of editing, we don't have to watch my slow virtual machine reboot. And this is why I didn't do it live, also because it probably won't work when you do it live. All right, and now we're taking off the, um, we're disabling Windows Defender because we're about ready to use a uh, hacking tool. So we're using Inve to act as a man in the middle attack, or a machine in the middle, which is kind of strange to say because you're actually on the same machine. But what's, what this is gonna do is it's gonna capture the network traffic that's coming to the machine. And since we're attempting to capture the installation on domain join, we're running through this fairly quickly. Ideally, if you are an, uh, a real attacker, and you weren't trying to demonstrate things, you could just script all this stuff. So I also turned off the firewall, I guess I should mention too, and that's just mostly for preventing the lab mishaps. And there I removed domain administrators from the local administrators group. And now we get to launch our power shell. And then we're gonna load up the Inve tool. after we stop the execution policy from. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about Inve. Um, we're gonna run that a couple more times, and so I'll talk more about it later. But right now, what you're seeing is I'm just loading the PowerShell script, and then I'm running the invoke Inve commandlet, and I'm telling it that I wanna see the console output on the screen, and then I also want to capture machine account credentials. And so here you can actually watch as the traffic's coming through. And we have, and, and this isn't edited actually. Um, this is just real time. And then here's all of our hashes that fly through. And so you saw all four separate hashes. Yeah, we know Windows Security. We did that on purpose. <laughs> And so we can stop it and then we can run the uh, git inv and we can pull all of the NTLMV2 hashes that we were captured, all the unique ones. 
And here at the bottom, you can see that we got the push account one, two, as well as that DA. And then there at the bottom is the, the win SECM computer account. Did you say that one of those was a NTLM hash for a domain admin account? Um, yeah, it was just in my lab the way that I configured it. And if it, and if it was, then why would you need Plank Forum, right? Right, so, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so five minutes. So five minutes is all it's going to take to uh, pull all of the credentials for all of your configured hash accounts. Yeah, all of the hashes for your configured push accounts. Sorry, I mixed that one up. So what can you do with a hash, right? Well, you can crack it, as most of us are aware. So you take it offline. If it's not a complex hash, and if you've got a nice hacking rig, it can be possibly cracked within seconds. But what if you can't? What if it's a much more highly complex password, it's very long, then you can pass that hash around in what's called an NTLM relay attack. And that's what we're gonna do next. So in picking on the definition of a strong password, we're actually gonna use the computer account for this uh, next demonstration. And I picked that for two reasons. The first reason is that, like I had said, it's essentially the definition of a complex password. It's a 120 character password for your computer account, and it rolls, I think by default, every 30 days. Uh, but it's not just a computer account. It's also the SECM server account. And while you think that might not be cool or anything, uh, you need to examine some of your installation and also some of the best practices that are out here. So if you're using a remote SQL server for the database for SCCM, you had to grant that computer account access to your SQL server database, possibly the SQL server itself. If you're using a secondary site, you've done the same thing. You've added the computer account as a local administrator on that secondary site server. This one is potentially to be scary too, and this is if you're using a systems management container in Active Directory. You've delegated Active Directory rights to that computer account, hopefully just on that OU, but you never know if you did it at the root, you just gave full control, right? Nobody does that. And then this one I think is fun too. Uh, Craig wrote a blog that argued that you could just use the computer account as the push account and just add it to the local administrators group on all of your endpoints. And um, in, in case you think that these are just old articles that I found on the web just by doing Google searches, they're not old, but I did just search on the web for a bunch of stuff. They are, those last three are released within the last year. And if you're an SCCM administrator or you're around uh, for a new period of time, those two in the middle are Projwell blocks. So Projwell is essentially the authority on SCCM. So I trust him and he blogs about it. Oh, and just one more thing. So you remember we dumped the hash earlier of the computer account, as well as all of the configured accounts. Well, if we actually follow Microsoft best practice, and we do not allow a deal and fallback to occur, it's gonna do what we thought it was gonna do. It's gonna prevent the uh, Kerberos and the Intel and authentication for all the configured push accounts. So if we remove the SPN, then we can't authenticate it with Kerberos. If we set this setting, then we can't authenticate it through NTLM. And so none of the client push uh, configured accounts are gonna attempt to authenticate to that endpoint. The computer account does. So this is our first way that we can circumvent this setting. So this attack is a little more complicated than the first. So I just wanted to briefly introduce uh, what a man in the middle attack is and how it attack might work. So first, the victim computer, which is essentially the computer from our first attack. The victim computer and the SCCM server are communicating back and forth, and this is just normal communication, client-server communication. They determine that the client needs to be installed on that victim machine. Lucky for the hacker, he happens, to, or she, happens to be in the middle, push the wrong button, and they capture the hash during that communication. This is essentially what we saw in that first attack. They then grab that hash and they relay it to the target machine. 
And in this example, the target machine is one of the machines that we have uh, added the local administrator uh, of the SCCM computer account into the local administrators group for the target. And so for this attack, we are uh, taking NTL and fallback and we're disabling it per, per the best practice. And we're going to see the same techniques as attack number one. This second attack is broken down into two separate ones. And this first one is just to essentially prove that um, what I say is true regarding the computer account still sending the NTLM hash. And so we're just replaying the very first attack. And I learned how to type really fast for this. So this time we're adding the Hacker2 account. We're taking the SPNs off. The only difference is in SCCM, we've now changed that NTL and fallback setting. And so what's going to happen is when we launch Invey, we're going to listen to that conversation, and then we're only going to see the NTL and hash for the computer account. So this is going to give me a second just to talk about Inve. Um, I found I, I found this tool as part of this project, and I think it's really cool. So Kevin Robertson is the one that wrote this, and if you just Google search Inve GitHub, you can find the tool if you're not familiar with it. So it's more than a man in the middle tool; it's also a spoofing tool. Uh, you might have seen that at the very top of it. It turns on the LLMR spoofing and stuff, and there's the only hash that is sent. And that was the only authentication attempt that occurred during this setting. And so here we can verify this by just looking at the security log and verify that the computer account did in fact authenticate with NTLM. I don't know why I added this part to the presentation, to be honest, other than the fact that you don't necessarily have to run a hacking tool to test this in your environment. You can go into the event log and you can visualize it, I suppose you know that we sent the hash because you literally saw the hash come through. <laughs> okay, so was that the hacker that was running the SCCM? That's a good question. So the question was, is that the computer account of the account that just joined the domain, or is that the computer account of the SCCM server? So that's the SCCM server account. The SCCM server computer account always attempts to authenticate to the endpoint. So that was, for whatever reason, a um, something that they decided to do as like a fail-safe, I guess, to where if you don't have any accounts configured, you could potentially use that. Uh, I, don't, I don't honestly know why it doesn't. I just know that it does and that it's bad. And so now that first piece of it is not only just showing how that communication works, but it's also set up something that can be a repeatable process. So as an attacker, what you're going to want to do is you're going to set up your Kali or your tools here to listen, and then once you're in, in the position to listen for those hashes, you can then cause the target to perform the behavior. And so the second half of this, we're using man in the middle six, and we're gonna spoof IPv6 traffic and capture the credentials that way. We're also going to use NTL and Relay X to relay those credentials to our target. And then we're going to use proxy chains to connect remotely. And by the end of this one, we're going to get an SMB shell on our target machine without knowing the credentials at all. So here we're just verifying that the settings are set the same that I had said that they were with the allowing. TLM authentication disabled. Here is IPv6, which by default is enabled. So if you're not using IPv6, disable it. If you are using it, then please don't disable it. So this is our target machine. I should pause that on my bed. Here, I'm going to try to go back. I got a couple minutes. So, sorry about that. The, I'm changing my mind. In 
embedded YouTube. Sorry, this is just a two minute video anyway. So after this thing, I'm gonna show the desktop of the target machine. So that's gonna be the machine that we're eventually trying to hack. So here I showed IPv6 and I got talking about IPv6, my bad. The uh, target machine is, there. That's the WI, uh, WIN SECM account added to the local administrators group. And then there is a text file that says not hacked. And so we're going to hack it by changing the text file. And so here we're booting up our uh, man in the middle six. And that's going to be our listener. And now we've set up NTL and relay with a target of the IP address for our target machine. And now here we're going to simulate a patch cycle or just sitting and waiting with, with this. But this is going to be what forces the SCCM server to connect to our man in the middle six. And when it does, it's going to be given a IPv6 address. And now it's going to think that my Kali machine is uh, able to communicate via IPv6. And so here, as soon as the computer comes back up, it's going to send that hash. And now, <laughs> so there's the hash it sent. Here's our NTLM relay, and there, about four lines from the bottom, is where it attempted to connect to our target machine. And then there, you can see that we do have an admin status of true on our target. And so we have the avail availability to connect with proxy chains. And here, we're running SMB client to connect to the C share on that account with the Win SECM computer account. It asks for the password here, but you don't need an end password. You can just hit enter. So here, I can now traverse the operating system. I can put, well, uh, malware. So I created this text malware. It's the first of its kind, I think. And then I'm going to just infiltrate and remove data from the client. So this just proves a couple of the things that an attacker might be able to do. And here on the target machine shows that we have changed the text file to hacked. Okay, so that was just a really quick uh, NTL and Relay example. And the thing that I think is kind of cool is if, if we did this and we captured all of the hashes, kind of like we did with the first attack, and we got all the hashes for all the configured accounts, we could set up a target, we could target everything in that subnet, or everything in that environment. And so we could essentially spray all of our NTLM hashes across and determine where it's an administrator and where it's not. And then we could target machines based on the information that we have there. So we could start popping shells on all of these machines. And so with that said, I'd assume that maybe the NTLM fallback wall, you could use it to, to protect the uh, computer, not the computer account, but you could at least protect all of the service accounts that you have configured to prevent something like this. What now, Steve? <laughs> What's that? Oh, we can force the hashes. So we can force the hashes for all client push accounts, not just the computer account. And so like I had said earlier, earlier this week, Microsoft released the information on this KB article and the related CVE that proved that there is a uh, NTL and fallback is not honored. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. And so as an SCCM administrator or on the SCCM server itself, you can run this command or you can essentially just right click and add device. And when you add device, you can set up an IP address as the computer name. The MAC address doesn't matter. It doesn't care about the MAC address. And so when it adds a device into SCCM, it adds it just as that 192. I don't know why it does that but that's just where it shows. And then when the client attempts to push, because, because there's no associated uh, Active Directory object, it can't use Kerberos to authenticate. So it's gonna attempt to fall back to NTLM, but it shouldn't be able to fall back to NTLM because we set it to not do it. And 
for whatever reason, I and I don't know how they patched this, honestly, um, but I do know that direct IP communication is always going to use in TLM, so it must just be a bug that they did not account for. And so while this is cool, and it earned me a CVE, it's not a weapon, because you have to be on the SCCM server to add the computer to it. Or at least it wasn't a weapon. So earlier this year, there's a tool called Sharp SCCM. Um, Mayhem, AKA Chris Thompson from Spectre Ops is the author of this tool. And he and I have uh, gone back and forth a couple times on, on this and, and worked together and the tool does a lot of cool things. It's, I think, in its third iteration now, and it keeps adding different uh, vulnerable sort of things to it. But when it was first released, what it did is it allowed us to register a new device in SCCM and then trigger the client installation. And the reason this is cool, and the reason it's a weapon, is you can do this as an unprivileged user from any domain joint computer. So you don't have to have access to the SCCM server to do this. And so instead of talking more about it, let's watch it. And so for our last attack here, we're disabling the NTLM fallback uh, per best practice because that's essentially what we're attacking and proving that we can. And then I think the best way to do this is to just show a comparison of what standard install behavior looks like versus behavior using Sharp SCCM. And so what I'm gonna show you in the first half of this demo is just what a normal client installation looks like. And so here we verified again that allow connection fallback is unchecked. This hackney machine is already joined to the domain and in SCCM it just doesn't have the client push to it. And so this is that machine. So here I have my shell with domain administrator and here I'm just gonna show you and confirm that I haven't messed with the SPNs on it at all, just to confirm that it's just a normal, classic installation. We've disabled uh, the firewall and Defender on this as well, just because I like watching Inve and I like watching hashes like just appear on your screen. It's just not as cool if you can't just watch it happen, so. Um, and then here I'm just trying to get all of the credentials again, so I remove the local the domain administrators. And so we're going to set up our inbay listener. And once the listener is set up, I'm just going to, instead of waiting for domain join or whatever, we're just going to manually push the client. And again, what you're going to see here is me, yep, I'm going to go to the SCCM server and I'm just going to right click and install client. And we could, we could do this a number of different ways, but for demo purposes, this is just what a normal installation might look like. And so here on Envy, we're going to see something that we haven't seen before, and that's Kerberos authentication. So that's all that Kerberos looks like, and all it says is authentication method is Kerberos and the IP address. And we can prove that through the security log again. So here we'll find the login event. All of the uh, configured accounts did this. I just highlighted just the last one, which was the SCCM computer account. And then there you see that Kerberos authentication was used. All right, and now we're gonna go over to the shell that's running as our domain join account. And the reason I run it in the shell is because the tool does require just a domain user account to run. You can't run it as just a local account, which is what I booted the, the operating system into just a normal uh, local administrator account. And so here I'm running Sharp SCCM. I'm using the FQDN of the SCCM server. TRI is the site code. And then I'm telling it to invoke client push and I'm giving it the target IP of the IP address of this machine. And so it's generating a self-signed certificate here, and then it's connecting to SCCM, it's adding itself as a device in SCCM, and then it's setting itself up to retrieve the uh, client push. And so here, without changing anything else on the system, 
you'll see the hashes come through in TLM. And so that's, that is the vulnerability. And that's how we can generate and use SCC, Sharp SCCM to send us all of the hashes, regardless of the NTLM fallback setting. And here, one more time, we can just prove the NTLM hash uh, protocol was used. Quick question for you. You don't really have to. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So the, the main thing that the Sharp SCCM tool was doing at the end there was forcing the client push rather than having it wait for the normal cycle. Is that correct? Um, so yes, it was, it, was, uh, it was originally set up. And uh, when Chris built it, and he didn't know it did this, uh, when you set it as the IP address, because instead of using the IP as a target, you could just create like a fake computer or whatever. And then it would attempt to connect there. And um, he just did that in response to Matt's tweet in saying that you, know, you can uninstall the client or whatever. Okay. So by doing this, his original intention was to just be able to trigger that uh, authentication to and occur. And then you found the additional detail. And then I found the detail in that if you use the IP, that it didn't seem to allow, uh, it shouldn't have allowed NTLM to occur. And actually in one of his earlier blog posts, he points out that a fix for his tool and what he had shown using it was to, to, to set that. And I don't know what made me do it, but maybe I just don't trust him. Or... Uh, okay. So let's protect it, right? So now that we broke it, how do we protect it? And like Vincent said, we just burn it to the ground. So this is the KB uh, that just came out that patches the vulnerability, but in addition to that, you still do have to disable a TLM fallback. It is, it's, uh, it's not an OS patch, it's an application patch inside SCCM, so you would get it as uh, the same way that you would upgrade the application. I can't remember what the setting is called in SCCM to install the hotfixes. All right, like I had alluded to earlier, the domain join misconfiguration. So this is a big one and it's actually been in the news fairly recently with curb relay up. So curb relay up used this as a vector. It's not the only vector it uses, but um, like I had said earlier, by default, the add workstation to, to domain GPO, this is a user rights assignment. And by default, you have authenticated users in there. So remove that and add uh, uh, whatever group you may require would be a good recommendation. In addition to that, a lot of times you'll see recommendations to set the MSDS machine account quota to zero, and that's also going to prevent the issue. And then you can use explicit permission on OUs, so if you need like a help desk employee or something to add, got it. Um, it's only four, I have, oh, okay, yeah, you're right. Sorry, explicit permissions. Also, um, if you don't have access to do the GPOs or if you're only an SECM administrator, you can also just configure uh, exceptions. So in the system discovery settings, you can set up a excluded computer OU. Some other good mitigations are to harden your credentials. So all service accounts, not just client push accounts, but uh, service accounts, we recommend, Trimark likes to recommend that we have uh, 25 character passwords, uh, potentially 30 characters, I think is going to be our new recommendation. And that uh, they're highly complex, and they're also changed uh, on a yearly or bi-yearly basis. And that obviously is going to protect you against offline cracks. Also limit the access. So per Microsoft's recommendation, and I keep saying it, so don't make it a domain admin, so that's a big deal. So continue to limit the attack surface. And in doing that, never use a client push account on a tier zero asset. Can you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> no, 
never use a client push account on a tier zero asset. <laughs> so instead, I would recommend, <laughs> as you're texting your buddies right retina, um, I would recommend that you do a manual install. So whatever, so even if it's not a domain admin account and it's a server admin account, um, remove it from the local admins of the tier zero asset. And then if those per permissions for the computer account uh, are not necessary, then I would recommend removing the permissions on the SCCM computer account. Also, I mentioned earlier disabling IPv6. If you're not using it, that's gonna prevent the man in the middle six spoofing. It's a big guy, isn't it? Uh, also, a TLM relay can be prevented by using SMB signing. So enable that in your GPO. That is a little bit harder to do. I will admit, uh, this is also a little bit harder to do. If your SCCM is not set up to use HTTPS, it should be modified to do that. So using PKI is gonna enforce encryption and signing. And that's gonna help the uh, Sharp SCCM when you use the self-signed cert. Uh, it would still obviously encrypt. It, it's not uh, from a valid source. So doing the HTTPS would help that. Also disabling LLM and NAR, NetBIOS, and NTLM. Yes, try to disable NTLM. I know that one is terrible and very hard to do, but at least use NTLM v2 if you can. Most importantly, just don't use client push. Group policy install and software-based install are much easier. Also, and I can say this again for tier zero, if you are using SCCM to manage tier zero assets, SCCM is now a tier zero asset. So I would recommend re either not using SCCM at all on them or standing up a new instance of SCCM that can be tier zero that can manage only your zero assets. So you're talking about setting up separate, separate SCCM within the tier zero environment? Yes, yeah, so if you've got like a red forest or something, yeah, do a uh, SCCM just for that forest. All right, real quick, I've got like two minutes. Um, thanking all these people. So Trimark peers are awesome because they listened to me and they encouraged me and they let me listen. Uh, they listened to me talk about SCCM endlessly for like six months. Um, my WIU peers, so that's where my old employment, they let me come in as a proof of concept and do this to them. And um, so I thank them on that because it's not just a lab environment. I actually was able to prove it in a real environment. Here's some resources that'll be available later. And questions? Holy cow. I have like 30 seconds. Um, I'll ask you all the Okay, all right, go ahead. Uh, who had a question? Sorry. And I'll be, so I'll chill out here later too. So if you have a question and I don't get to you. So my talk will be <coughs> similar later. We can deal with some of those questions. Awesome. You're, you're giving the talk in like an hour? Okay, yep. Won't be as good, but... I bet it will be. I'm excited. I was looking forward to watching yours. Yes, sir? Uh, so for uh, using the... Uh, so still using those accounts, would you recommend using uh, managed service accounts? Typically, yes. Uh, SCCM, I do not believe, will let you use a managed service account. When you configure the client push accounts, it prompts you for a password. So I think you have to set the, yeah. So they do it in a stupid way. <laughs> like, he's like, of course you can't. <laughs> Managed service accounts are good for nothing. I mean, they're good for a lot of things, but you can't use them on a lot of things. Isn't it? All right, anything else? Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, would another mitigation be disabling automatic client approval? And by that, do you mean? I mean, like in SCCM, so I come out the street, join the domain, SCCM, and say, it's not approved. Yeah, yep. So you could do that. I think HTTPS helps with that, too. So you have to have like a push to cert for GPO or something to be able to even join. The other thing you could do is just not use the automatic push. So you could just set up a routine to push on only like known assets or something. All right, if you, anybody else has any questions, yes? Uh, that CVE you mentioned in the beginning, is that your CVE? Yes, that is my CVE. Yeah. 
you just entered security last year, you said? Yeah. It already has a CV thing. Um, so my boss, um, so founder of Trimark Security, Sean Metcalf, a, I, he found out that I have the CVE and he yelled at me and said that he doesn't even have a Microsoft CVE. <laughs> <laughs> so cut that from the record, uh, please. <laughs> but yeah, that, so I, I was super psyched that they came out with the, they released the CVE on Tuesday and um, they haven't, they, I actually found out about, from a reporter that attempted to contact me the next day and they said, hey, we saw you were credited with the CVE, and I was like, Microsoft didn't tell me anything that they were gonna release it, or what, and they still to this day haven't talked to me. Uh, so I was planning on giving the presentation regardless, but I think it's awesome that they didn't release it. 